Welcome to the 2022 Candidates Debate, moderated by the nonpartisan League of Women Voters of New Canaan. Candidates, thank you for being here tonight. We are grateful to Town Hall for allowing us to use this space and to NCTV Channel 79 for their production of the debate. Voters, we know your time is precious, so this year we're holding five separate debates so you can watch only the races applicable to you. A reminder that edited or partial usage of tonight's program is not permitted. For the first time at one of our debates, we're excited to welcome a select group of seniors from the New Canaan High School debate team. These, these seniors got to meet our candidates and they will be presenting the debate questions throughout the evening. It is heartwarming to know that when asked, these students enthusiastically raised their hands and were excited about participating in our democracy. Our hope is that by having these students here, more citizens, both young, old, and in between, will tune in, get informed, and vote. Questions for tonight's debate were submitted to the League from the public in advance. I want to take the time to thank everyone who submitted a question to let us know what was on their mind for this election. In accordance with our nonpartisan guidelines, our carefully selected team reviews the questions and often rewrites them for comprehensiveness, fairness, nonpartisanship, applicability to all candidates, and relevance to the office. The candidates have all agreed to a set of rules for the evening. While our students will present the questions, I will remain here and responsible for enforcing the rules, including the time limitations. But I'm sure it won't come to that. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Elizabeth Sawyer from the New Canaan High School debate team, who will ask the questions for this debate. Welcome to the candidate debate for Senate District 26, serving voters in parts of Darien, New Canaan, Stamford, Reading, Richfield, Weston, Westport, and Wilton. Our candidates are Tony Boucher and Cece Marr. The debate will begin with opening statements, followed by questions submitted by the public. Candidates will be allowed a one and a half minute response, followed by an optional 30 second rebuttal. We will end with closing statements. Based on random draw, we begin with opening remarks from Tony Boucher. Thank you. I have been deputy leader in the Connecticut State Senate for New Canaan, assistant minority leader in the House of Representatives for New Canaan, a Board of Education chair on the State Board of Education and Votech High School State Board, and also a selectman. I've held executive positions with large corporations and funded small businesses in Wilton and Norwalk, and also have been a director of a leading institutional investment company where I co-authored the white paper on ethics and nonprofits. I have a UConn MBA working with its business school right now to create an entrepreneurship department. I've held series 7, 63, and 31 investment licenses. This private business background gives me a real understanding of what it takes to start a business and create jobs. I have also know how painful it is to keep a business running and how much it takes to keep it afloat as the state keeps punishing businesses with high payroll taxes, high utility costs, and burdensome mandates that weigh it down. That is why the National Federation of Independent Businesses has endorsed my candidacy and hope that you'll consider Thank that you. when you vote. Cece Marr. Over the past four years, Connecticut has made incredible strides. We've gotten the state's finances back on track, addressed mental health needs, passed strong gun violence prevention laws, and begun critical investments in our infrastructure. This progress didn't happen overnight. It happened thanks to bold, focused leaders committed to taking our state forward. But we all know that we still have to do more. So how do we build on the forward momentum? Tonight, you'll hear two very different paths that lead in different directions. When my opponent was running for governor, she announced Connecticut had gone too far in regulating guns after Sandy Hook. I believe that as long as there are children dying, we have not gone far enough. I'll work to tighten our state's gun laws and am proud to have earned the endorsement of Connecticut against gun violence and moms demand action. I support a woman's right to choose and won't cave to extremist pressure. I'll tackle the climate crisis head on and invest in education. The question tonight is where, not isn't where we've been, but where we want to go. Thank you. We will now begin the first question. 
30 years after Stature 830G on affordable housing was enacted, less than a quarter of Connecticut towns meet the target of having 10% of housing stock deemed affordable. What do you think are responsible, reasonable, affordable housing goals for Connecticut, and how would you achieve them? Tony Boucher? Yes, I think that this issue is of top of mind for everyone here in New Canaan. Um, although a laudable in its original goals, 8 30 g has not paid out the way that people had expected it to be. Unfortunately, uh, too many developers have used that as, as a way to really bring unaffordable housing, expensive housing, to communities that are trying to make the decisions locally, which can threaten the entire quality of life in a community and put stresses on its infrastructure for sure. Democrats were able to get these laws through committee but paused their efforts when it was election year. And many, many residents wanted the state to have their hands off of their homes. However, there's deep concern that these past efforts will continue again when we start up again, no question about it. It is very difficult for local communities to absorb the student population from these high density housing complexes and the traffic is often intolerable. There are some ways that we can take care of this and we can do it by allowing um, the current housing that we have to qualify for affordable and also allow individuals to be able to create equity in their homes. We have a lot of affordable housing stock already here. The state doesn't allow us to count it. So I, th I really believe that we really need to reform that law, take a good look at it, change it, make it usable and workable, and allow the input of our local communities and our planning and zoning. To take away that even further, which is what is being done, uh, just strikes as to the local autonomy of our communities. Thank you, CC Mar. Yes, thank you. The um, statute of 8-2 was put in place to provide that control locally with um, towns being able to make decisions on their housing. Unfortunately, what we were seeing back in the 1990s was that the housing was not growing at the pace that it needed to in order to have housing for all of the residents. Right now in Connecticut, there is a 2.5% housing vacancy rate and only 1.5% vacancy rate in Fairfield County. Because of that, because we want to grow our economy, we need to have housing in order to bring in businesses and entice them into the state and also grow businesses within the state, we need to increase our housing stock. We, right now, ASML in Wilton is putting in $200 million worth of investment. They are going to add 1,000 workers and we need to have housing for that because if we don't have housing, not just for the workers we want to build our economy, but also for people who want to stay in our communities and for students that want to come back after college. We need to look at affordable housing, and I do believe there need to be amendments, but we can't just throw a 30G out because it's got 30 years of zoning decisions based on it. So we do need to amend it. Tony Boucher, your rebuttal? Oh. Yes, please, thank you. Right now, the state wants to have oversight over our looking local housing authorities. Instead, they should include existing properties that meet income-based affordability standards and eliminate the requirement for deed restrictions for owner-occupied affordable housing, which restricts the ability to create home equity. We want people to be able to create home equity. CC Mar, your rebuttal? No, thank you. I think, okay, on to question two. All states need revenue to provide services. What would you change about the ways Connecticut generates its revenue or how it spends it? CC Mar? I'm sorry, could you say the question again? Please? Yeah, sure. All states need revenue to provide services. What would you change about the ways Connecticut generates its revenue or how it spends it? Interesting question. Um, how would I change how it earns its revenue? I'm so sorry. I'm going to ask you one more time. No, it's totally fine. All states need revenue to provide services. Right. What would you change about the ways Connecticut generates its revenue or how it spends it? Well, from a generation standpoint, I think we do need to grow businesses. We have seen right now that we have a growth in um, 
the small business development. There's been a significant growth over the past year. Small businesses, plus we are seeing this growth in the fintech services in Stanford. As a matter of fact, UConn has just put in place a fintech, the very first um, degree in that, in UConn Stanford to support the area. So growing businesses, growing the way that we generate revenue is incredibly important. And Governor Lamont put in place Advanced CT, which is the first office of going out into the states and bringing in businesses outside from outside states into Connecticut. And that has been extre extremely successful. And so what we need to do is continue that in terms of how we would provide services and how we would change that. That is a very big question because it's an enormous budget and we have got to get really look at where we can save money. Perfect, thank you. Um, Tony Boucher. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I would ask the question rather, how can we reduce the cost of living and and, and having a business in Connecticut. When we have a uh, minus 4.7% uh, GDP in Connecticut, second worst in the country, and the lowest personal income growth, the worst in the country, we need to be asking ourselves, are we taxing too much? The good news is that when we were tied in the Senate, when I was there, we produced a 2017 bipartisan budget that placed a spending, bonding, and volatility cap. These spending controls which have, have actually produced really great surpluses today. That common sense budget also maxed out a rainy day fund and changed the way Connecticut pays down its highest in the nation unfunded debt. Yet more and more and higher taxes and anti-business policies are being pushed. We already have a 25% more payroll cost than in other states. Uh, in fact, our Many of our restaurants haven't survived, and yet they added another 1% on top of the 6.35% sales tax on restaurants and even prepared foods. So the question, and just recently, just recently, a 10% surcharge on corporate profits, digital advertising, a statewide commercial residential property tax was being proposed in this last session. The bottom line is we need to do something to give relief, and part of that would be to cut the income tax from 5 to 4% for families that are making less than 175 grand a year, repeal that highway tax, that diesel fuel. It's just increasing the cost of food. We also need to reduce the sales tax and eliminate that 1% tax Thank on you. restaurants. Thank you. Mar, your rebuttal? I do. Thank you. There's been so much growth in Connecticut. The um, Office of Workforce Strategy, which is put in place with the past administration, with this current administration, excuse me, was has really been focusing on construction, biotech, fintech. I'm so sorry, I'm confused as to your timing. It's okay. Um, biotech, fintech, and also healthcare. So these are areas that we really need to be focused. Okay, sorry. Um, Tony Boucher, your rebuttal. Uh, yes, as I said before, the, the primary focus right now in the state should be how do we keep businesses and people here? We're losing more people and businesses that are coming in. That's a very hard thing to face. Uh, in fact, the only in, uh, inward bound are those from New York, where it is the only other state with higher costs than Connecticut. So we need to take a look at that. We have not reduced any of the taxes when we put in the income tax. So it's just added on, and that's why we're the second highest taxing state in the country. Perfect, thank you. Um, question three. Connecticut is one of the few states that does not allow no excuse early voting, and our legislator cannot consider early voting measures without a change to our Constitution. The November 8th ballot will ask voters if they approve such a change to our state Constitution. Many voters want to know if they vote yes, what early voting measures a candidate will support. What is your position on early voting? And if elected, what specific early voting measures would you support? I'm Tony Boucher. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so many people are asking me about this question. I don't see a problem with us enacting early voting in our state of Connecticut. There are many other states that have it as well. But my view would be that we should have no excuse absentee ballot voting. That allows anyone to vote using a system that we already have in place. That would be more seamless. 
uh, less problematic and certainly a lot less expensive because the system's already in place and uh, they can get their ballots uh, earlier and be able to um, write it in and send it in um, and so they wouldn't have to come in in person. Again, the high costs of creating another system, a lot of questions still remain as to how that would work, um, would have to be considered as well. CC Mar? I think that early voting is a really tremendous idea. It was on the, we had a referendum years ago, it didn't pass, people didn't understand it. And so there's been a lot of training and education out there right now. Connecticut is one of only four states in the country one of four states in the country that does not have any form of early voting because it is inside of our constitution, which is why we have the referendum. In terms of the impact on registrars, I know that that is being considered. It is certainly something where there will have to be funding that goes along with it. But early voting for people who cannot get to the polls, for a mom whose child wakes up sick in the morning and now she has no one to watch the child, for someone who is working shifts that are not conducive to the poll times, for someone who is caring for a sick relative or elderly person, these are all incredibly important and we need to allow voter access for everyone. We need to make certain that we can get people to vote because it is their vote is their voice. Absentee ballots are definitely something that have been tremendous during the, the pandemic, but a huge proportion of people like to vote in person because they feel as though that is their Right, and that is something that we have certainly. I know that I took my children to the polls when they were young to teach them. Tony Boucher, your rebuttal. No rebuttal, thank you. Um, CC Mar, um, your rebuttal. No. Uh, no. <laughs> um, okay. Question four: Connecticut recently enacted legislation to protect the rights of persons both both receiving and providing reproductive health care services and to codify access to more reproductive health care service providers. Do you support Connecticut's current position and why? Or what changes, if any, would you recommend? CC Mar? I very much support our Reproductive Freedom Act and our defense of reproductive freedom. And um, I think that giving the ability to make sure that a woman has a choice, that she has the capacity to not be imposed by um, laws that are put on her by a government are very important. And I completely support that. And in terms of making, the only thing that I would want to do is make certain that we protect a woman's right should something happen where it gets becomes a national ban, I will fight to keep that from happening in Connecticut. I want to make sure that we put it inside our constitution because for women to have lost their ability to make decisions for themselves is not okay, and I do not accept it. Tony Boucher. I've supported a women's right to choose throughout my time in both the House and Senate with my voice, with my vote, with many, many debates. I've been on the record on this. Um, in fact, I have a record that shows this voting for the morning after pill in the Senate uh, during that time. It is codified in state law by both sides, and it will continue to do so. Um, there are many, many difficult issues around this, no question, but Connecticut is solid. It has bipartisan support. I don't ever see that changing. Additionally, I would support a constitutional amendment to that effect uh, so that there's no further discussion about this going forward. Anyone uh, that uh, would say that I would change it is just playing partisan politics on this issue. CC Mar, your rebuttal? I do have a rebuttal, thank you. Although my opponent says that she has always um, protected women's rights, in fact, she has not. And in particular, when she had um, the opportunity to vote for the consent laws, um, affirmative consent, she did not vote for that. As a matter of fact, she voted for the amendments, which took apart 
the affirmative consent law. Tony Boucher, your rebuttal. I think that um, there are many that speak about this issue, and additionally to a lot of other issues, uh, can simply talk about it. But I've had to be there. I've had to do the work. I've had to vote. I've had to debate. And I was very, very happy to support this. This issue is very personal for a lot of people, including myself and in my own family. The decision about a woman's body must be between the doctor and a woman, no one else. Okay, thank you. C question five. Connecticut residents have faced increased energy costs and service disruptions. What legislation would you propose to improve our energy and resource infrastructure to ensure future access and affordability? Tony Boucher. Well, uh, energy is very important topic, not just for us personally in our homes as we're seeing our heating bills go through the, through the roof. It's also one of the main things that businesses are having to confront because not only do they have high taxes and high payroll taxes and mountains of, um, of mandates to comply with, energy costs is one of the big factors in order to stay in business. So those high energy costs in our state uh, are a result oftentimes because many of our energy bills include a number of other fees that are put in there. And some of them are very good. They uh, include uh, hardship programs, energy efficiency programs, certain environmental goals in which the utilities are required to enter into contracts. However, um, these fees should be unbundled and put where they belong, in the Department of Environmental Protection, not in uh, the energy area. And that's why the DEEP should be changed. PERA should be a separate entity. It's energy, and it has a different mission and focus. And the DEP should concentrate on environmental goals that are incredibly important as well. So separating the two would be really important. We also need to upgrade our grid to enhance reliability. Uh, this year, the Democratic control legislator is trying to usurp uh, over, uh, some control over this, and we want to make sure that we bring it back and concentrate on our sources of energy. Because as we are promoting uh, alternative fuels, solar energy, we also have to recognize that 40% of all of our energy comes from nuclear, one, our one nuclear plant, and certainly natural gas, which a lot Thank of you. people find controversial. C.C. Mark, your turn. The energy costs are really, they're high. We're, I'm seeing it in my own home. It is not something that I'm looking forward to this winter. I've had to change my own planning on how I'm going to pay my energy costs. It's a problem. Um, I'm not quite sure where Ms. Boucher comes in on the nuclear, but we do have, for the next 10 years, we do have um, our costs coming, our energy coming from nuclear, and it is the, one of the cleanest energies that we have. Um, one of the things that we need to be doing is looking at renewables and ways of making sure that we make it easier for people to put solar power up, that we create more of our wind farms. It is incredibly important that we look at green energy and ways that we can include that into our grid. And that includes looking at net metering. So as we're giving our um, as people put solar on and it goes into the grid, when it comes back out, we have net metering so that people are not paying the costs of having the solar. So there's a lot to look at in terms of energy. The costs are high. We need to address it. And we will do that in the legislature when I'm there. Tony Boucher. Yes, I uh, absolutely embrace um, alternative fuels. And in fact, in my investment business, uh, we worked very hard to invest in alternative and new ways to pro provide the energy that we need in our new global economy. Unfortunately, however, um, the high business costs and doing business state also affects the cost of our energy. They exceed the national average. These costs are reflected in the utility rates. The cost of salary, wages, land, land taxes, including property taxes, are some of the highest in the nation, and these costs are passed on. Perfect. Thank you. C.C. Mar? No, oh, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, no? Okay. Other than reducing taxes, what ideas can you offer for Connecticut to attract... Oh, sorry. We invite... Our candidates to present their closing statements, starting with Tony Boucher. 
Throughout my service, I worked hard to seek compromise, civility, and respect on all sides of the contentious issue. 80% of the time, Democrats and Republicans agree. 20% of the time, the issues can become very difficult. Compromise is what makes government work, passing effective laws by getting both sides to agree. Today, this is considered an anathema. The political climate has been much like rival gangs trying to prove loyalty by demonizing the other. Bipartisan civility compromise are what we need a lot more of today, and I helped to negotiate many bipartisan bills, including the Sandy Hook gun bill, where I joined three Democrats and two Republicans to help craft our land bike bipartisan control bill of 2013. I actually got primaried as a result. I voted for bills that enhanced a woman's right to choose, the morning after pill, gay marriage, and the 2017 budget bill that changed the way Connecticut pays down its debts and produced the current surplus. A tie in the Senate yield much better results than partisan bickering. That's what we need to get back to. Thank you. Um, CC Marr. Thank you. This November, we're at a crossroads. In the aftermath of the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and threatening to strip women of fundamental rights, and the continued Republican-led efforts to undermine common sense gun laws, Connecticut's future is on the ballot. This election is also about the very fabric of our state, the kind of Connecticut that you want to see have for yourself and for your children. There are two very different visions in this race that will lead to two very different futures. In my years of service as a licensed social worker, then executive director of Person to Person, and most recently at Sandy Hook Promise, I've developed a history of concrete results, meeting the needs of today and planning for tomorrow. I'll do the same as, the same as a state senator, creating opportunities and delivering outcomes that benefit us all. The 26th district needs a leader who can look forward, not backward one who puts the needs of everyday people over partisan politics. This concludes our Senate District 26 debate. We thank our candidates and our viewers for participating in democracy.